request was the one who made it really popular. Oh, oh yes, she did the genius. Yeah. Little Abby, little blonde. Bombshell. <coughs> Joe Bait. I will fill your mouth with laughter and your lips with shouts of joy. Not everybody has the same sense of humour. And I guess that's good, isn't it? Some like the visual slapstick Olive and Hardy Marx Brothers style. Some like subtle. Some are witty. Some are the life of the party. And then some of us are just punny. Punny. There's nothing like a joke or a sense of humour to get you through the tough times. And I found out that the doctors say that laughter is like internal jogging. It actually widens the arteries. It de-stresses the heart and it strengthens the immune system. Proverbs 17, verse 22, the writer says, A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a broken spirit saps a person's strength. Now I guess I don't continue on now with a joke, don't I? <laughs> Please. Okay, you guys. A band of adventurers accepted a mission to kill a neighbouring king. But before heading out for the fight, they decided that they would hire a mercenary. The first one was a swordsman. And he asked for 1,000 gold pieces. Well, they went along a bit further and the second one was an archer. But he wanted 2,000 gold pieces to join them in their fight. But the last one was a spear thrower. And he was willing to do it just for the experience, for he was a freelancer. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose you would think now that the sermon would be a good idea if it stopped here. <laughs> Don't you reckon that would be good? You know, we would leave with a smile on our face. But perhaps there would be an empty spot in our heart where teaching and learning from Scripture has left a spot for the morning. And I think there's a spot in your heart this morning for some of that. But of course, there's not always a time for life. Genesis 18, 1 to 15. Now that might be a surprise to you. But that's our subject for this morning. You see, I was speaking with John through the week, and he was doing this as, this, as their study with that they do, John and Joe. And they were doing so I think, don't you, that it'd be more equitable if John comes up this morning and takes this passage. I've already had my laugh for this one. <laughs> You've had your laugh? Yeah. And we've had enough too. We want to hear your perspective. Okay, alright. So if you're willing to hear my ramblings, then we'll carry on. And as you can see, um, Linda, oh yeah, she's up there. Linda's got this all set up for us, but I'm not going to read it again, because you've already heard it. So therefore, I've got some time up my sleeve, which I've already factored in the read. So now we don't need to go through it all. But what I want you to take, to take uh, with me this morning, I want you to come with me on this journey of bronze musings. Because some people might find it if it uh, was a little bit heretical, what I'm going to say, and 
And so, for those of you who are visiting, welcome. It's lovely. And we just read in one of the lines of that song that the Church of Christ will be the only church. So, that's lovely, isn't it? So you've come to the right place. And you know, we're pretty uniform right throughout the country, Churches of Christ. Because in every service you'll find the same things happening. It mightn't be in the same order. They might sing different songs. But there will be a spot for the communion. There will be a spot for singing. There will be a spot for some sharing. And there's also a time when we get the Word of God and open it up and see what He has to say for each one of us. That's what we want to do now. So in the reading, it says, He was sitting at the entrance to the tent. He was sitting at the entrance to the tent and he could see for miles around. He wasn't like as if he was sitting in the middle of Morayfield or the middle of Brisbane City. No. He was sitting out in the desert. His tent was pitched and it was near a grove of trees. The trees of Mamre that have no significance to the story or meaning in scripture for this particular moment at all, but just a place where Abraham was. It was a place indicated. And also, there's a good spot to plant the tree, to, um, to put up your tent, to put, make sure it's underneath some trees for shade. It was the middle of the day. Would Abraham, as he's sitting there, be expecting to see three strangers arriving out of the glimmering in the heat, shimmering in the distance? No. Last thing he would be expecting to see. There's no indication of their coming. He couldn't see any dust indicating people on the move in the distance. He couldn't see a caravan of camels, donkeys. There's none of that. There's nothing to indicate that somebody was coming. But there was something about these strangers that Abraham knew was different. There was something different because he had a sense that there was a divine presence. You see, it wasn't the first time that Abraham had been confronted by God. We look in chapter 17, verse 1, and I think... Um, I didn't use the mic at that one, but I'll not read that one. It's also... Now, when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. Now, that was the previous time. Scripture doesn't say exactly how long it was between, but most commentators seem to think it was only a few days difference. Now, hospitality, as John was saying, and um, he said quite correctly that it was not, uh, you know, it wasn't optional in those times. It was rather old that, that you provide hospitality when strangers come to your door, when people come to visit. And generally, it was a sharing of what you had. It was just a sharing of what you had in the place at the time to share with the people. But the scriptures say that he went and bowed low to the ground in abeyance. This was the custom of those who come into the presence of a ruler, those who come in the presence of a king, those who come in the presence of authority, you bowed low down to the ground. And I'm only just thinking 
you see, my mind says, that's the worst thing for me, bending down. At my age, if it's on the ground and I don't need it, it can stay there. <laughs> Bowing down, I'd have difficulty getting up. I'd have to be looking around for some eunuch's arm or somebody to be able to get myself back up again off the ground. But apparently at 99, Abraham didn't have any problem with that. I just look in, in awe. He bowed to the ground. And then he did something unique. It was different. He used the singular when he said, My Lord. There are three men. They all probably look the same. They're all angels. But he said, My Lord. Indicating he knew that God was there amongst them. And then, to my mind, although I did read in one of the commentaries where it said extravagant, but in my mind it was completely over the top, his response. Because he invited them to come. He made sure the servants came out first with the water to wash their feet, the custom of the time. He made sure that that would happen. And then he asked them to stay for a meal. Now, that wasn't as simple as you and I. He couldn't go to the freezer and grab three bullies prepared frozen meals and put it down in front of them, could he? He couldn't get some sausages out that were left over from the barbecue. He had to give them a meal. But I think that being Abraham and being who he was and recognising who he was, he wanted to give the best. And as I thought about it, and I thought probably, you know, if I knew that God was coming to my place for dinner, I probably wouldn't go out and buy mints. I love mints. I've got no problem with mints. But why? Why do I say that? Because you want to give the best. You want to give the best to the king. You want to give the best to the person that you respect and admire and love. So what would I do? Being an Aussie, I'd go out and get a mud crab because I can't afford it. And that's what you'd get. Or some barramundi. Or some wagyu. You would get the best, wouldn't you? You wouldn't put sausages down, as much as I like sausages. But then he needed to take over. He took over Sarah's role. Do you think Sarah hadn't baked any bread before? She made probably hundreds of loaves of bread. But then Abraham had to come in and take over her role. He says, get three seers, 18 litres, of flour. No, 18 litres of the best flour. So there were grades of flour that they used. And he said, make sure you use the best flour and get 18 litres. I don't know how much bread 18 litres would make, but I'm sure it would be more than enough to feed three men. You see, this is how my zoning mind works. Then, to go and get the meal ready, there was no meat hanging in the safe. He had to go and choose a car. And he picks the facts car. Not the one that was looking a bit skinny, a bit rumpy. No, he goes and picks this out and then says to the servant, Prepare this for my friends. Now, if he said that to me, and I was a servant, I'd be thinking, hey, listen, mate, I didn't come here with a butcher's qualification. First of all, I don't know how to kill it. Secondly, how do I cut it up? I wouldn't know you've got to skin it, haven't you? Anyway, that's how my mind would work if he had to do this. So that's how this meal had to start. 
First of all, it was still on the hoof. And as John said before, they would have been waiting a while. Can you imagine how long they would have waited to kill this car, kill this car skin it, cut it up, cook it? Well, they had to get the blood drained, of course. So, by the time that was served to them, he also provided them with cheese curds and milk. Very expensive and something that was really appreciated in those times because when you have a, a nice meal, what do you look for? Pudding at the end. Don't you? The pudding. I was never allowed to leave the table when I lived with my grandmother until I'd eaten my pudding. So everybody had to have pudding. Everybody has to have sweets. So he provided that for them too. And I suppose if you're looking at the cost of this meal, looking at it in terms of today, you're talking about veal, 20 bucks a kilo, cut up a whole calf, it's two sides. When I was being mean and nasty and growing up and, and rearing a family, I used to go and buy a side of mutton. Well, the side of mutton I used to get at Mitchelton, it cost you just a few bob, and we'd make that last for about two or three weeks. So how long is a whole calf going to last? Poor old Abraham, which what's left over. I'm sure those guys weren't going to eat a whole calf. So Abraham then had a problem of leftovers, didn't he? What was going to happen? I don't know whether he envisaged that or whether he took that into consideration. All this because Abraham had already had that encounter with God only a couple of days before. And although the three men were angels or agents, God was there. Not in the physical, because as we all know, that the instruction of Moses from God was that no man would ever see his face and live. But God was there and spoke through these people. Now we move to Sarah. The whole purpose of the visit was for Sarah. Yep, the whole purpose of the visit was for Sarah. The three men inquired about Sarah, but only spoke to Abraham. Was that sexist? Why didn't they call Sarah out and speak to her face to face? Inform her of the purpose of their journey. But he said to Abraham, I'm going to come back this time next year and Sarah will have a son. I can't understand why he didn't call her out and say it. Sarah overheard it all. She was inside the tent. I mean, they didn't have soundproof walls. They just had a goat skin or camel skin covering. She wasn't invited out, she couldn't come into their presence until us. And she heard it all and very sardonically and bitterly laughed within herself. How could somebody be so cruel? She had been barren for so many years. And now at 90, her whole life was geared for one purpose, and that was but having a child and to be a child there. Her expectations in life weren't very varied. Their expectation was that she would marry. Even from her teens, she was, knew that that was her role in life. She wasn't looking to be a professional secretary. She wasn't looking to have a high 
position at a school. She was looking to be a mother. Now, she was 90. That's gone. No chance of being a mother. She endured the ridicule, the stigma, the finger pointing her whole life. Now she thought that was behind her. She'd gone through all this. She'd failed. She'd failed in her role. Now she thought that was all finished. But the height of this guy who'd come who said that. You know? It was an impossibility. At 90? I suppose she would be thinking like Michael Caton in The Castle. Remember the film The Castle? It's a classic Australian movie. He was always selling something. And when his son got a phone call and came and told him the price that the guy was offering, Michael Carton used to say, tell him he's dreaming. Tell him he's dreaming. She must have thought the same. My husband, tell him he's dreaming. After all the time of suffering, again, it's all come back at the hands of a stranger. So she cynically laughs within herself. But, you know, Sarah had thought no differently from her husband when he was told the same things. Let's read chapter 17, verse 17. When Abraham bowed down to the ground, hang on, I'll just go back a bit to the to a little bit, and he says in 16, And I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she will become the mother of many nations. Kings will be among the descendants. This is the Lord speaking to Abraham previously. Then Abraham bowed down to the ground, and he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I ever become a father at the age of 100? He wondered. Besides, Sarah is 90. How could she have a baby? Was Sarah's any different? Was Sarah's thinking anything stranger than what her husband was already thinking? But she was rebuked. She was rebuked by what she thought. And yet that rebuke did not go to Abraham. But of course Sarah now, having thought this and being found out, because it was God who was talking in human thoughts, and he said it, that you'd laugh in her cynic response. And when found out sometimes, I don't know about you, but I know I've been guilty that I've been found out by something stupid and silly in the relationship at home, and when I've been asked about it, I've told a few. I've told a lot. Now, I know that doesn't apply to any of you, but that's me. And I can understand Sarah at this particular time. She decided, okay, I didn't say it. I really didn't say it. But God said he didn't. I guess you could say in defence, not that I'm here to defending God, but it's just the way my, my mind works. Perhaps God was preparing Abraham for a specific role. He was preparing him for a role which required great faith. He was to be the father of many. The father of many. He was to begin the nation that God had wanted for his own. So the person who is the father of this nation needed to have a great amount of faith. Now perhaps 
His laughter didn't reflect a lack of faith, but rather a limitation of that faith. Do you have that? Does your limitation of your faith impact on your everyday? Not every day, but on your everyday living as such. It does for me. If sometimes there's an impossible thing that's about to happen that you have no control over, how does that affect your faith? Did you know? For God to give barren women babies, no matter what age, it must be a breeze. It must be a breeze for him. Why? Hadn't he made the blind to see? Hadn't he made the deaf to hear? Hadn't he raised children to life? Hadn't he brought terminally ill people back to life again? All had seen. But this was now another God opportunity to show his people his love and his plan for mankind. When we're faced in these impossible situations that we get sometimes, when there are no answers, are our hearts sometimes a little bitter and cynical? Do we have a Sarah moment? You know, we can read when we do that what that divine visitor said to Abraham in verse 14. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? You know, how you answer that question will depend upon the peace of your heart and mind. Has your life had Sarah situations? So often, we want to shrink God down to our own level and our own expectations as Him as we are. But God's in the business of bringing hope to the hopeless life to the spiritually dead and a renewed hope for the morrow. Perhaps our Sarah failure was massive and we've made it into this mountain that seemed impossible to pass. We continually blame ourselves for the situation that we're in because we are in this mess. John Ortberg thought the same and he wrote this, I regret the pain of failure so keenly that I back away from owning it and learning from it. I could not heal and move on. I wanted to bury it so deeply that no one could ever guess it was there. Not even me. I needed to learn to pray. Paul says in Colossians 3.15 Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. When we learn this principle I guess it should bring a smile to the face or even some holy laughter. Thank you John. Alright, in the next two minutes, let's sum up uh, 